Amen. You know, as we've been journeying through our series on Luke's greatest hits, I've been thinking to myself, well, what makes a greatest hit? You know, back in the day, we used to count units. You know, those vinyl records that some of us still own? You know, I always look forward to Sundays, not just for church, but because I got to listen to Casey Kasem's American Top 40, where we count down the greatest hits to that number one hit single. Now I suppose we probably measure that by TikTok streams and YouTube videos and Spotify downloads. But I think there's another way that we might determine what a greatest hit is. And that's a song that we all know the words to. For folks of my age, it might be something like Bohemian Rhapsody. You know, I see a little silhouette of a man, got a moosh, got a moosh, when you do the fandango. Right, right. Or, you know, for the greatest generation, maybe it's a, a Frank Sinatra song. You know, start spreading the news. I'm leaving today. I want to be a part of it. New York, New York, yeah, you got it. Now, for some of your kids that are scratching your heads and going, I don't know what you're talking about, you know, a hater's got to hate, 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 and a player's got to play, 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 and I just got to say, 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 shake, shake, shake it off. Almost messed it up. When these songs come on in a room, we all just start singing along, right? And our scripture today is one of Jesus' number one hit songs. Probably the number one hit song for the centuries. It's a song that we all know the words to. And it's a song that we share with so many in our Christian community. So the words that we say the same, more or less. These are the words of the Lord's Prayer. And we say these words because these words matter. Because these words are not just a petition. They are a proclamation of our relationship with our creator. And these words are meant to transform us. So let's take a deep breath and hear the words of our Lord as recorded in the Gospel of Luke. Listen for God's word for you. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us into the time of trial. And he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend. And you go to him at midnight and you say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. For a friend of mine has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, do not bother me. The door has already been locked and my children are in bed with me. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is a friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I ask you, ask, or say to you, ask and it will be given, search and you will find, knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, you would give a snake instead? Or if a child asks for an egg, you would give a scorpion? If then you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Well, there's so much to cover here. Honestly, it could be a whole sermon series, but I promise to keep it short. So I want to focus on just the beginning and the end of our scripture today. And I want you to consider that prayer is not just something we say, but it is something that we do and live, and it's something that is meant to transform us. So let us pray. Gracious and loving God, may the words move our hearts. May your spirit be with us. And may you calm us to hear your word for us today. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. During my first year at seminary, back in 2020, before the pandemic happened, I was sitting at my dining room table, and I got this text that says, are you coming? And I put back three question marks, and then I get four letters back, S-O-F-T. Well, the soft retreat is a retreat that happens every year that invites seminarians and people studying rabbinical schools and people studying in Muslim cemeteries to come together and to share their faith tradition with each other. And I had signed up for this and I was told that there weren't any more spots, but someone had canceled and I had a chance to join. So I threw some stuff in a bag and I told my kids I wouldn't be there for dinner and I sent a text to my wife explaining the situation and I jumped in the last car leaving the parking lot on the way to this retreat. And I'm so blessed that I did because I got to share scripture and meals and prayers with people that were studying to be imams and rabbis and pastors and priests. And my big takeaway from this really was the persistence and reverence of their prayers. Our Jewish friends pray three times a day besides the, meal, the prayers over meals. And our Muslim brothers and sisters pray five times a day. You know, Christians back in the day used to pray the hours, which was seven times a day. And some Christians still do this. And as I was thinking about this, I was forced to admit that my own prayer life was a little haphazard, a little sporadic, maybe a little anemic. And I think maybe this is how the disciples felt when they came to Jesus that day and said, teach us how to pray. And I can imagine their rabbi and their friends kind of sighing and going, didn't you hear my great sermon on the prayer just a little bit ago? Why are you asking me to teach you how to pray like my big cousin John? And I believe that that, that sigh, that oh, might have begun that prayer with the words, Abun Demashmaya, which is our Father in heaven. These are the Aramaic words that begin the Lord's Prayer that Christians throughout the world still pray to this day. Abun Demashmaya. Come on, let's, let's say that first word together. We can do this. Abun. Say it with me. Abun. See how it echoes and resonates in the room? Abun is a combination of Abba, father, and womb, for mother. It's combining both the masculine and the feminine into the divine name of the creator. Abun embodies the breath of creation. When you say it, you feel that breath go out into the world, and you feel that interconnectedness with all of creation. And Abum also implies this deep connection and relationship between each other and our Creator. For we are all children of God. And this relationship is confirmed by the words that follow. Hallowed be thy name. We are asking God to make God's name holy. We are saying, Father, Mother, Holy Parent, uphold the holiness of your name. Act so that people will know that you are holy. This is not some sort of transcendent holiness. This is not something far away and out of reach. This is an imminent holiness. This is a holiness that you can feel in here and that you can see 
out in the world. We are claiming that God, as our holy parent, and we are proclaiming that God shows up in our world and in our lives. And we're asking, God, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus describes to us exactly what this looks like in very down-to-earth terms. Bread, forgiveness, and the avoidance of suffering. And in Luke's version of this prayer, these gifts are ongoing. They're continual. Jesus instructs us, may we continue to receive our daily bread. May we continue to forgive. May we continue to live under your protection. You see, the prayer acknowledges a relationship that is already in place. Jesus comically emphasizes this point with these parables that we have at the ending. We are encouraged to have the audacity of one who wakes up a neighbor in the middle of the night knowing that that person will get up and answer the door because that's what neighbors do. We are encouraged to have the persistence to continue to knock, to continue to ask, trusting in God, our holy parent, who would never give us a snake in lieu of a fish or a scorpion instead of an egg. However, anyone who has been on this earth for any length of time will tell you that prayer is not like a genie's lamp, where if you rub it the right way or you say the right words, Or if you say the words often enough, you will get what you want. Prayer is meant to be transformative. And the truth is that you may not always get what you want, as the song goes. But that door will be opened for you. Because prayer prayer is transformative. Not the transformation on the outside. It starts with the transformation on the inside. It changes us. It begins with acknowledging a relationship that already exists. A relationship with a loving God that is continually coaxing and luring and seducing us into this ever greater embrace of divine love. This is the prayer that Jesus taught his best friends and his disciples. And this is the prayer that Jesus teaches us as well. On this Sunday, as we receive new members into our congregation, these children of the church have been working diligently for months, preparing their faith statements and learning about our faith tradition here. And I want to I name something. This is hard work, you all. If you haven't had the chance to write down a statement of faith, I encourage each and every one of you to do it at some time. And to continue doing that. Because what you will find over the time is that the way you express your faith changes as you change. Here's the thing. Prayer, or faith, excuse me, is not the creed. It's not the statement of faith. Your faith is based on this relationship. This audacious affirmation that your relationship is with the divine creator of the whole universe and you can come to them and say, Father, Mother, Holy Parent, and know that they will receive your prayer. Do you all know what the difference is between affirmation and confirmation? Yeah, I'll be honest, I wasn't sure either. When we affirm something, we are validating something. We are stating something positively, and I think this is what your your statements of faith were, right? They're affirmations. But confirmation takes this a step further. Confirmation means validating, testing, and knowing something to be true. And it also implies strengthening and giving assurance. We confirm and strengthen our faith Every time we pray, our Father, hallowed be thy name. Even when we don't get what we want. When we say, our Father, we confirm and strengthen our ongoing relationship with our Creator 
that began before we were formed. We confirm and strengthen the faith and the relationship of that holy parent that knows us better than we know ourselves and loves us all the more. When we say, hallowed be thy name, we confirm and strengthen that trust in a God that shows up that continually is made known in our lives and in the world. For those of you who are being confirmed today, and for those of you that were confirmed long ago, and for some of you that may be looking forward to confirmation, this is my hope for you today. That you will continue to confirm and strengthen and deepen your faith through an active, vibrant, and audacious prayer life. Not just on Sundays, but every day of your life. And I commend you all to remember those words that Jesus said to his friends so long ago. Abun de Bashmaya, our holy present, our holy parent, make your name holy. May we rest and live into the Jesus' assurance that our prayers are answered by a loving God who continues to make their name holy in our lives, in the lives of our families, in the life of this congregation, in the life of his church, and throughout the world. May it be so. Amen.